file is you can start now hi good evening good evening i am kens hello this is liz i am going to present disruptive technologies the first of its kind for our initiative called the imk it tech talks so why did i choose this uh, topic many a times people come to technologies like us and say i wish i understood your domain and uh, um but your domain is actually moving so fast we cannot keep up yes it's overwhelming for us to so today may i with your permission attempt to make technology relatable so first we'll start with gratitude apologies disclaimers caveats and the likes about epjb it tech talks the kochi campus and uh, us the imk kochi uh, center is launching it tech talks it has been our wish to bring technology speak to our crowd we are triggering this with this presentation we planned more in depth on technology mentioned and more stay tuned so i'm assuming in good faith that my audience has a decent grasp of technology but this is how we're a known technical presentation aimed for inclusive crowd so i would like to thank the imk ec supporting cch dch the enterprise and social media team the iim khan team the epgp pgp and the rest of imk for this wonderful opportunity to connect share and discuss thank you very much namit parvath mark for giving the legs to the ideas we think about truly appreciate it uh i must to remind you about an important thing do not forget to make a difference our small a contribution let's unite for a cause contribute to our imk covid support fund if you hadn't it is will and will always be the thought that counts so thank you very much for the people who have done it you know who you are and it has been a brilliant watch it is setting in brilliance in a day that is tomorrow nearing our target currently at a grand total of 24.5 lakhs congratulations it's sorry you just shy of our target 25l and you have changed lives and that is commendable thank you very much for your contribution that's actually close it with a bang so with regards to apologies um it's going to be a um, a long presentation so here is how we are trying to make it it turns out that i cannot see the chat and but i have help so namit and parvath is going to help me out and they are going to watch the chat for me so after two or three topics we are going to take a break and i will be answering questions and then we can move on and hopefully by the end of things uh, we would be actually understanding what this is all about so thank you for your patience and let's i hope it's not going to be a death by presentation and we'll continue to live happily ever after so this is me this is thomas and i'm employed with ibm with the data and ai brand for the last 8 years i'm managing uh, asia pack implementation for risk analytics solution architect by trade i manage a team also and uh, i'm an it b tech graduate so engineer by i don't know profession and i am also an imk graduate so 19 years of experience in it and currently i have the privilege to be the center head for kitchen uh, imk alumni association thank you for electing me so what is disruptive technologies so there are innovative trends that significantly alter the way that consumers industries and business operates so what does it mean we can actually see in a few bits so how do they disrupt they sweep away systems or habits in revolutionary ways there are two classes of this one is if it displays an incumbent technology in a phase transition during which users adopt a new technology so uh, one of the one of the most interesting example for this is i would rather say um 
horse carriages in England. So horses were the main um, transportation in England and uh, it came to such an extent that there were so many horses on the, on the, on the driveway and the manoeuvre of the horses was actually swept to the side. So it stank to high heaven and it was not the, the best of things. But they got used to it because there was no other way and only the rich could actually afford horses and horses were uh, for, a, for a while fragile. So if a horse breaks a leg, uh, they would be put down and you would lose a horse and then you have to buy another one. So then the automobiles came. It was hard at times, it was a rich man's fantasy. So in time, the common man got it also. And what happened to the horses? So they phased out and it became a novelty to the rich. So now only horses um, are with the rich, not with the common people. So the second one is, a second class of disruptive technology creates a new market where none previously existed or existed and um, this would be I would rather say okay if I have to guess I would first think about computers but then there was the abacus and the, and the calculators before that but the perfect example is the internet there was nothing before it and it is going to be more revolutionary going forward and it will change the way that we see things so why do they disrupt? It's a simple reason. And I would rather say that it is efficient. That's the reason why they disrupt. And they have attributes that have recognizably superior in nature. And this is the reason that they disrupt. So technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence, internet of things, augmented reality, 3D printing, camps. So these are things that uh, are we are going to see in a short while. So this is in random order, so we will just have to start very quickly on this. So Internet of Things, somebody said, Eduede Orivo said that the Internet of Things is not a concept, it's a network. The true technology enabled network of all networks. So that's what they said. Uh, this is a definition, a book learned definition of Internet of Things. Not much can be understood out of this. So I can tell you a story about it. So let's say that a person, we'll call him Ben. Okay. And Ben has a smart home. Okay. So Ben also works in an office. So Ben actually works um, Monday to Thursday and Friday he works from home and uh, so Ben had a plumbing problem, or a plumbing problem, okay. So Ben had to call a plumber and his name is Jack. So Jack is available only to Monday to Wednesday and Jack needs a person to unlock Ben's home. So Ben thought about it. So Ben said, not a problem, I have wearables and my home is smart and I can actually make sure that your job can be done without my presence. So Jack is configured with a wearable and Jack goes to uh, Ben's home. The doorknob understands that a person which Ben knows has given access to is approaching within 200 meters so the doorknob opens the door and it gets in so Jack gets in does his plumbing and Jack is thirsty so Jack thinks let me get a beer from the fridge so Jack goes and gets a beer on the fridge and he thought that nobody's watching so I don't have to report this or I don't have to tell Ben about it so he drinks a beer he goes and Ben comes back. So when Ben comes back, the doorknob actually opens. His, the doorknob is so happy, the, the lighting changes, the music is on, and Ben goes to the fridge, and the fridge greets Ben. He says, 
It says, Hello, Ben. There was somebody here who took your beer, and it was not you. And I captured a picture of him, and here he is. Ben checks the picture. Oh, it's Jack. So the fridge has not stopped talking. So the fridge says, your vegetables is nearly empty. The bread basket is empty. You will not have bread for um, breakfast. Should I order it? It will be delivered in one hour. So the, the washing machine squeaks and says in the sweetest voice, Ben, your wash basket is full. Why don't we wash clothes? So Ben is still upset about the beer. So Ben thinks, let me call Jack up. And Ben shouts, can you call Jack? The, the speaker on top of the fridge actually dials Jack's number and it is connected to Ben's Bluetooth. And Ben asks, did you take the beer from the fridge? And Jack asks, who told you? The fridge did. So I don't know what happened to Ben and Jack, but you can understand how Internet of Things works here. So it is a better definition than this, I would rather say. And what does it mean to us? Is that something that happens in a developed country? I don't know. Let's find out. So let's understand the size of IoT. Consider this, and you're going to read this, and I'm going to watch 30,000 desktops, 300 million desktops connected to internet already, 2 billion mobile phones. In 2025, 13 billion things at home is connected, 3.5 billion navigation systems, 411 million wearables, 646 medical is connected to the internet and on top of it your street is smart so this is what is going to happen to you so what does that mean to you specifically it's the heating that turns on when you head home it is the traffic lights that are just to your flow of traffic it is the empty parking space that communicates with your car already here the door that unlocks when you're near it's the kettle that is ready when you walk through the door. It's the fridge that orders milk when you're running low. It is the pill bottle that messages you when you forget your dose. So this is all here. And internet is just getting started. And this is our future. So industrial IoT, touted as the most substantial change. Let me put this in perspective. In the 1700 and 1800, there were machines. We called it the Industrial Revolution. In 1900 and 2000, we had the Digital Revolution powered by computers. They combined to create the Industrial Internet of Things, powered by intelligent machines. We have startups here who are actually working on Industrial Internet of Machines. So if EPGP people know Rashtam's um, startup does this, they are into Industrial IoT. So what happened now and why now? So two factors, uh, low cost sensors, China was actually leading here. So it is estimated that a trillion sensors will connect the world by 2022. And this is the World Economic Forum, which said that last year. So there is also the long range wireless technology. So I'll give you a perspective here, Wi-Fi, our own Wi-Fi, connects 35 meters per device, but LoRa, okay, long range um, wireless technology is 15 kilometers per unit. So I'll give you an example here. So one of our startups um, in EPGP, Rody Labs, okay. So they were actually doing a consulting um, for the forestry department. I happen to be the shameless witness and eavesdropper there. So here is the scenario. The railway is actually cutting across the forest. And so the forestry department has connected to somebody and that somebody has connected to Rody Labs and asked, can you help us with a solution? So they asked, what is the problem? The elephants are dying. So they're getting hit by the train and they're dying or they're getting seriously injured. What can be done? 
So Rory Labs, I think, has given a solution which involves long-range wireless technology that is connected by solar power to do AI. So the driver can actually um, detect uh, elephant-like shape ahead, I think, maybe 200 or two kilometers away and warn the drivers to slow down so that no wildlife is hit. I, I would suggest that they might be looking at more than elephants, but that would be a start. So this is how people near to us is actually working on this kind of technology. It's pretty exciting. So how do we do this? As management consultants or as management MBA people, we understand GDP more. So let me explain this in terms of GDP. So by 2030, GE predicted that the industrial Internet of Things will add more to the global economy than every other country except USA and China. So the estimated size of the industrial in the Internet of Things is between 15 trillion US dollars to 10 trillion US dollars, which is more than India at 6.6 .6 and Japan at 6.4, but lesser, slightly lesser, or significantly lesser than USA or China, which is at 24.8 and 22.2. And this is just 2030, so it will grow because the world is actually an oyster. So we are coming to blockchain, and blockchain is a financial challenge. So Blythe Master has actually mentioned it very aptly. It's a financial challenge of our time. It is going to change the way that our financial world operates. So we have blockchain experts who might be giving us details on that. But let's get an overview of what is actually happening here. So consider the scenarios. A pharmaceutical company, counterfeit drugs, supply chain, using blockchain to stop the flow of counterfeit drugs. A bank using blockchain to reduce time required to settle cross-border bank transactions. A shipping company using it for supply chain to track goods. And governments using blockchain to open trust, transparent and collaborative networks. A food company quickly tracing food products to their source and potentially reducing the threat of diseases and spoilage. Markets using blockchain can trust a source of origin for organic produce in agriculture. So what is said about blockchain? It's a popular technology. So the first thing that we heard about blockchain was bitcoins. But blockchain is more than a cryptocurrency. So it is said that blockchain will be doing for transactions what the internet would do for information. That's a pretty huge statement. We refer it as the new operating system for trust. And blockchain allows increased trust and efficiency in the exchange of almost anything. If you want to sell anything, if you have blockchain, it is transparent. So blockchain is now being used for not only finance, it's also being used for a streamlining of processes and transactions from everything from flower, real estate, banking, education, government, healthcare, hardly a day passes by that you cannot name an industry or a sector which is blockchain ready. So what the F is blockchain? You can if you can see the the diagram here, let me let me point this out to you, this one. So let me explain this to you. So one party requests a transaction and it goes to a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, an impressive design. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parties connected to each other. They must be having business interests and they are called the peer-to-peer -peer network. So if a transaction is coming to this particular network, everybody has to actually be party to it. You have to get it approved by every party. Individual nodes receive the request and validates the transaction using an algorithm. They have to say that, yes, I believe in it and I endorse this transaction and I am okay with it. And the approved transaction is transmitted as blocks and added to a public ledger. So ledger is a transaction record. And one of the blocks, once the blocks is added, 
it becomes permanent and complete so you cannot delete it it's not indelible okay so the three key features here is decentralization transparency security to this you can add privacy also because uh, data of a transaction cannot be um, cannot be stolen from a blockchain network so that's how we are trying to do that so here is a, a short video on what we see blockchain in supply chain management Modern day business relies on a complex web of supply chains, with products, parts, and materials often shipped thousands of miles and from many destinations around the globe. Many shipping supply chains are bogged down by a maze of paperwork and a multitude of handoffs and go betweens. A single shipment of goods from East Africa to Europe can require over 200 unique interactions with dozens of individuals and organizations generating a stack of paper records. Documentation, when lost or delayed, can cause perishable goods to be ruined as they wait to enter port. And in some instances, it can cost as much in paper and administrative flow as it does to pay for the shipping itself. The good news is the distributed ledger technology, blockchain, is ideally suited to the world of shipping because it establishes a shared record of all the transactions within a network and then makes it easy for permissioned parties to access trusted data immediately with no intermediaries or verification of physical documents needed. By providing a single view of all transactions taking place among a complex network of parties, blockchain can help eliminate considerable resource waste. It can protect against fraud or theft and bring accountability to the entire shipping process, from the factory, to the warehouse, to the shipping carrier, to every stop along the way. And it works with other technologies like artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and analytics to help companies move and track goods digitally across the supply chain. For example, when food distributors monitor temperature data from sensors placed inside refrigerated trucks, the data can be stored on the blockchain to make sure that it's secure and able to be traced. If the level climbs above a certain degree, drivers could be notified before the food spoils. The same technology can be used for connecting electric vehicles and charging stations to energy grids to make them more efficient. It can be used to stop the flow of counterfeit drugs entering the supply chain and affecting patients, or at a bank to reduce the time required to settle transactions and validate a payment in real time, or really in any industry where complicated transactions among multiple parties take place, where security and reliability are paramount, and where data is flowing in from everywhere. So that is the IBM Curiosity shop and uh, just hold on, I need to do something that must be bugging you. annoying and sorry about that let me go back so blockchain at work so here is an interesting use case uh, building blockchain for a better planet so this case study was actually uh, given to IBM and we found it very interesting so it's about a plastic bank a not-for-profit business that was created using the IBM blockchain blockchain technology with a goal of transmit, um, transforming plastic from environmentally dangerous garbage into something of value. So David Katz, the founder and CEO of a Plastic Bank, uh, said that if you're walking down the road and every bottle on the side of the road was worth $5, how much would be left? None. So that's how his non-profit um, organization works. 
in developing countries like Haiti and Philippines. And I went to Philippines, I saw this in Manila, and it works. And when I saw Plastic Bank, I was, I was happy to see that. So the group, the group works with regional businesses to turn plastic that litters oceans, rivers, beaches, parks, and streets into a new kind of currency. Instead of cash, they receive a digital token on their smartphone, which can be exchanged for goods who use plastic banks' infrastructure. So they can shop for groceries, they can do school uh, tuition payments, and they can actually have medical insurance um, uh, payments done by basic utilities like use of a solar lamp and paying a few cents for that. So this is blockchain as a summary. So this is the infographics and you can see, so if you just follow my mouse. So here it is where all started. We start with the history of internet. In early 90s there was information highway. Ten years later we had the web 2 interactions and we have social media we have e-commerce we had peer-to-peer -peer interactions we had sharing economy then w3 came in and decentralized web we started with nine years of bitcoin and then a central idea came that the peer-to-peer -peer should be actually having no middlemen so that means trust should be important so smart, uh, we started with money without banks and uh, also advanced technologies. So IP protocol turned to local data storages, centralized on our device. Who owns the data? And we actually transformed with uh, data monarchy to data democracy. So instead of centralized, we did it decentralized, distributed, and less union or less, uh, one second, uh, point of failures. Tokens, cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer network, and everybody started to say that it's expensive. That is, go to blockchain. And then we had the smart contract. And at top, on the heart of the smart contract, we had digital handshakes that runs on um, blockchain and reduced transactions. So no third, third party, referees, private keys, and reintroduced privacies we don't have today. So it became a game changer. We had distributed networks, technologies, value exchange protocols, top-down approaches, decentralized autonomous, and this was a totally different future. So blockchain, uh, 3D printing, AI, IoT, and where to apply this? Banking, e-government, energy, Internet of Things, accounting, supply chain, insurance, disrupting governance, decentralized, autonomous organizations, bitcoins. So where is it going? Not really sure, but it's going somewhere. So here is the game changer that is blockchain got introduced into the application layer and the internet layer. So this is actually something that a computer engineer understands. So this is what is blockchain in a nutshell. Okay, so after artificial intelligence, we will break for questions. But let's finish this. It's pretty exciting. And uh, I know quite a number of people who does this, and including some IMK people that I know. So a year spent in artificial intelligence is enough to make one believe in God. That's what Alan Perlis said. So picture this. Data is being created at an unprecedented speed, and today 80% of it sits behind organization firewalls. And why is that a concern? Because the organization, um, the entire community of organization does not know what to do with it. And business sits on top of this vast pool of data, but hasn't exploited its value. So business and technology also started changing. Worldwide spending on AI is expected to be more than $57 billion in 2021, according to the International Data Corporation. So how is AI helping, helping solve problems? Elementary school teachers are using AI technology for teaching specific needs of their students. A food company is using AI 
machine learning analytics to evaluate thousands of variables, leading to reduction in food loss. A bank is using AI for facial recognition technologies to advance fraud detection. A retailer is actually trying to predict the type of marketing campaign using AI and delivering the best outcome for specific customers. So how is AI helping to fight COVID? This is interesting. Blue Dot, a Canada-based um, enterprise, actually was the first one to call out the COVID virus on 31st December, much more earlier than World Health Organization and US Center of, for uh, Disease and Control, so CDC. So we also have diagnostic AI, which means that a Beijing-based oncology with, uh, um, with technology can actually predict from a CT scan pneumonia with 92% uh, accuracy and a recall rate of 97% on test data. So we also have chat bots that actually have natural language processing capabilities to help people to answer questions relating to COVID. And we also have information verification AIs. So giant uh, check technology giants like Google and Facebook, the people who run search engines and social media, are battling to combat uh, waves of conspiracy theory, phishing, and misinformation and malware. This is important because uh, one of the biggest battles that uh, governments have for pandemics or war or anything is the fear that uh, is generated in the public. So if you look at why chatbots are so important, so just imagine a person with a fear is not actually comforted with logical answers which he cannot he can relate to. His fear goes to unprecedented proportions and it creates unrest or hysteria, mass hysteria. So that's something that governments avoid and especially uh, technology companies like Google and Facebook the propagation of data in terms of news and videos is going to be a problem. So Facebook actually has um, AI to take down um, fake news and Google also has it. As soon as it is uploaded, it actually looks for um, keywords and uh, uh, verified sources and makes sure that it is taken down and not published. So this is supported at real time with AI. The speed at which it moves is something that we have to comment AI on. So there's more actually. We have facial recognition and fever dictator, uh, detectors. Uh, I think it is actually uh, happening in the Fortis hospitals right now and uh, quite a few hospitals right, right now. Apollo is one of the biggest example. So it can detect fever and it is also installed in airports, bus stations, and any mass traffic centers that you can actually detect an individual with mask and with face recognition and fever. And this is something that we have um, in place right now. So there is intelligent drones and robots. The robots actually help the medical community or the first li line responders with uh, um, I would rather say social distancing. So if uh, um, a patient with a contracted disease which is infectious, a robot can be used for food and medication and primary health care and ensure that he's not abandoned because it is contagious. And some drones are used to track uh, individuals. Um, you have seen a lot of videos, people actually being chased by uh, police drones and the police is actually grateful to having drones to sur uh, survey public uh, places for um, I would rather say more than one person or three person congregations. So we also have the curative research AI, a game changer in startups like Accenture and uh, what they did was they became the first company to present an AI-designed drug molecule that went to human trials. A year it was what they took. And an average uh, trial period for traditional research is five years. And you might have seen that 
there is a lot of COVID alternatives that came, just popped up, and um, they're all vaccines are going to trial in less than five to six months. It usually takes more than three years to actually go to clinical trial. So what they are trying, looking at is alternative medicine. So what is alternative medicine? So if I can give an example, aspirin. Aspirin is used for, um, I would rather say, headache and a fever. So it can bring down a temperature and it can elevate pain. But a little is known for a long time, until very recently, that aspirin was good for cardiac patients. It thins blood. So if a person is actually at cardiac risk, um, doctors used to prescribe baby aspirins so that if they take it, their the risk of cardiac arrest is actually considerably less. So these are alternate medicines that one of the medication that was published or released for one particular use later was found out to be of another use. So alternate medicines, why is it important this? They have already finished clinical trials. They know they know that it is not harmful to people. So what AI did was, the first thing that they did was they actually uh, researched the, the structure of the virus. Then they researched the structure of the probable molecules of medication that can actually work against this virus. And then they decided to find out what are the molecular structures that is nearly or similar to any known drug. So what they found out here was ibuprofen does not work for um, COVID, aspirin, paracetamol does, and interestingly, anti-HIV drug also does. So these are the first things that they found in the first five days of COVID virus inf infestation. And that is interesting for us to see. So drugs actually has a lesser time to get done. And we can come to a, a computing model later on where you can find out that there is other computational features of other technologies that actually tries to make and find out drugs much more easier. And this is called the quantum computing. So we'll come to that later. So IBM Watson. IBM Watson is actually IBM's supercomputer, which helps business learn exponentially, which means that it keeps learning, adapting, and improving. So the ability to learn exponentially is becoming the major source of competitive advantage for any company. So IBM has it right now for uh, IBM Watson. So I am also in the brand of Watson. So it's interesting to actually work with it. I have worked with it. So IBM Watson specializes in driving value and knowledge from 80% of world's data. And that sits in the enterprise. So I'll give you an example of how this works. If somebody took a Watson subscription from uh, the IBM cloud and installs it in their enterprise, IBM has access to their own data, can crunch it, and it can also derive data from the internet, which is freely available. So uh, the, the computing power of what IBM Watson was mentioned, that it could process about hundreds of thousands of research paper and um, help um, doctors to um, prescribe and to identify symptoms uh, based on what has been actually entered into the computer. So. Uh, Watson is actually a cognitive uh, computer, which means that uh, Watson will, if, if a person actually comes to a doctor and says that he has cold, and the doctor says that, okay, Watson, this person has cold, he has a blocked nose, he has um, sneezing, and he's a running nose, and he has a cough, and all those things. And Watson would actually say that maybe he has a common cold, or he has an allergy, and he has this, he has that. Everything that the symptoms can throw out, he can, they can actually have this particular suggestions done. So the doctor can actually choose the, the probability based on his knowledge on what he saw with, the, with his patient and say that, I think it's a cold. So Watson learns that, that if it is a combination of all the three of them, then it's most probably like a cold. So the ranking of the cold goes up for all the three combination for any other person in the world who enters this particular 
uh, combinations. So what happened here is Watson was helpful in detecting cancer and at a very faster rate than any other um, medical data that was possible. So Watson uses a number of algorithms to help organization learn and eliminates guesswork. It is giving a ranking system and I have seen it work. It is, it is actually requires a lot of machine learning. That is, you have to teach the Watson with a basic set of data and then it should be learning from its mistakes and the more the people use it, the more Watson gets better and in two years Watson is really good at what it does. So Watson is at work in 80 countries across 20 industries. It improves customer behavior data. Uh, using customer behavior data, it improves uh, customer retention. It takes on cyber crime with cognitive security. It diagnoses and treats disease. And um, go on. Yeah, in-depth examination of supplier delays and providing next generation analytics to finance. So I think I should be predicting the weather around the world. And this is one of the Watson's favorite pastimes. And it also improved employee retentions in organizations. So IBM has employed Watson uh, analytics for employee retentions. It actually suggests to, ma to managers, perhaps you have to give this person a raise because he has done this, this, and this. So to help organization respond to COVID situation and answer people's query with Watson Assistant. So Watson Assistant is a conversational AI platform. It engages user to solve the most complex issues. So currently it is in use with the city of Austin, the Polish Ministry of Health, and it's tailored to any industries. So you can see it here. And it's running in, in at less than 24 hours. It offers uh, Watson and via the IBM Cloud and will assist with the initial setup. So this is what might go wrong with AI. So let me address this as AI bias and the rest of it is actually the, uh, the, the characteristics of AI. So AI bias here is, um, how to explain this I would rather say is, there was a scenario recently in the papers that, uh, and it was, it was controversial also. Somebody actually phoned in the, the police commissioner and said that uh, we think that there is an affair happening between uh, a priest and a nun and they are going somewhere in a, in a motorbike. Okay, so this person actually said, mm, I have to find that out. So, and it, it turns out that person who phoned in was helpful with the, with the, with the number of the, the motorcycle. So he found out from the vehicle department and he found out that that person was indeed a priest. So he called him up and asked, uh, did you go somewhere today morning? So he said, yes, I went. I went to the nearby railway station. My sister, who is, an, who is a nun in the, in the next um, district, she missed her um, a bus and I went to drop her. So you can understand how, how data is misconstrued. So it turns out to be bias. So if you see that a person, uh, there, was, there was also a, a quiz that came here very recently which ran in down the WhatsApp is the CEO of a company was the, the parent of a son and the person said good luck and he said and the, the question was it was not the father so half the people actually said it might be the grandfather the stepdad and all those things it turned out that the CEO was the mother and half the people said that they could not they could not think that a female person can actually be a CEO of a company. So those are biases. So what happens if AI is programmed with a person of bias? So AI does not know how to, how to learn on its own. So the data which a human says it's good, the AI learns. So the data of the human with the bias gets inside. So that's what I was trying to say. And we call it AI bias. And deep learning, 
is something that uh, is happening very fast right now. So once upon a time it was machine learning that is teaching a robot to learn some things. But deep learning is once a robot or a machine learns, it will continue to learn with its experience and using non-linear pro processing and structure and unstructured data. And it can also happen with the natural language processing, the NLP. So the natural language processing, NLP, is interesting. So I think I have told this before in the women's meet in IMK. Last uh, December, I brought the, the Echo Dot home. So it came via the Amazon, it was installed, and it was a great matter of curiosity for my mom and my kid. And um, so on Christmas Day, I found my mom giggling, and she was finding something very funny. I asked my dad, what's going on? So my dad said, um, she just asked a question, and Alexa answered. So I asked my mom, what's going on? So my mom interestingly asked my Alexa, would you date my husband? And Alexa didn't break my mom's heart. It said that, no, it wouldn't. And my mom found it very delightful. So Alexa does not have to answer those kind of questions. But it has been taught in natural language to respond to such question with the tact and the diplomacy of a human being. And that is what natural language processing means. That is, English-like language is understood by a machine and has been taught to respond in kind after processing. And this is what is happening for all kinds of OK Google and um, Alexa. And I think the iPhone's um, Siri, everybody is actually using natural language processing. So it's not as bad as you think. Everything here you're used to, but you didn't know the language or the, or the name for it. So this is what is happening here. So before we go to quantum computing, I would actually stop for a bit and take questions. So I have to rely on, I think, Parvod and uh, Let me see. I, I don't think I can see. So, Parvat, can you hear me? Or if you can actually ask, post any questions, it would be great. So, it's a break for you and a break for me. So I think Harish has asked that as an MBA graduate, not much of a coder or a technological Greek geek, how can one end up working on these technologies? How to land up in projects done on technologies by big companies? Okay. So you would be surprised to hear this answer. So we do not want coders anymore because we have a lot of it. Technologists who were actually working in Java and, um, and Microsoft um, languages, they are fast adapting much more than you think. So does that mean that people like us or let's say MBA graduates who does not have any, any uh, background in coding, does not have a future in IT technology? The answer is surprisingly no. You do have a future. So I will give you I will give you examples. So I will give you examples where we think that thank you. So I will be giving you examples where we think that this is going to be surprising. We are looking for non technologists, which means that if you are domain expert in finance uh, interestingly, IBM actually hired about 10,000 doctors in IBM India just for Watson help because try as I might, I cannot learn medicine now. 
and wants and needs expert advice. So that is just medicine. So there are technologies where we are looking for experts on functional domains, banking and uh, artistry, that is uh, social science. And uh, the reason why I'm saying social science is humanities is big for uh, AI you now because we are trying to teach um, robots to be human. So social sciences, um, religious biases, and how to behave correctly in different regions is becoming big right now. And uh, interestingly, we are also looking for language experts. Language experts in the sense that if you look at uh, Google, okay, you can translate English to any language, okay, but you cannot have something in Hindi and you cannot Google a Hindi word and ask what's the meaning of it in Hindi itself. Okay? We try really hard, Google is learning very fast, but then the next trends are language to language, that is in, in Malayalam or in Hindi there would be there would be streams that comes in which has language specific uh, bots or language specific um, meanings and um, technologies which is going to be enabled. Language translation and language interpretation is the next big thing for us. So I hope I answered your question. It was a really good one. And uh, interestingly, there are people or there are companies who are looking for functional people like us. If you're good at your domain, you are valuable. So that is what is um, valuable right now, expensive data. So we are looking for data. Oh, yes. So Nisha KR has asked that few scenario where uh, IoT can be used for a medium scale manufacturer. Is technology affordable to us? Yes, I think so. Because um, don't go for big companies, okay? Don't go for IBM or Google or Microsoft and ask for IOTs from them. Uh, what I understood for the last three years, okay, and this is where I opened up and started exploring entrepreneurs. So one of the few things that I found out is in Startup India or Startup Kerala, you can go there and you can find kids working and they are doing things in IoT and they are doing things in, um, in a lot of things. And uh, the reason why I'm saying that, um, interestingly, Rody Labs also does, does IoT. They are actually the pioneers for that. And what I found out was their solutions, including the students and the medium entrepreneurs that I, I have seen, their solutions are far less expensive than the bigger companies. And they are much more viable because IBM is actually restricted to the IBM's own structures, but the middle to um, to I would say startup companies they are free to use anything and they can give you solutions that is far more more economical to you than anybody else and uh, uh, I also I think Rashtam also does this and um, I I am sure that if I look at in the, in the entrepreneurs club uh, there would be many people if you just put a question there there would be about five to ten quotes on how much can you give for us and that is how economic um, it is coming. So I will break down IoT in what you understand. So Internet of Things would mean that there would be um, a physical component and electronics and there would be a component which is computing, okay? And then there would be something with the hardware. And um, one of my classmates in 10th and 12th, he actually started up his own um, IoT just nearby and uh, he has been doing it for the past 12 years and uh, one of the few things that I was surprised to know is I didn't check what he's doing and he didn't think that I would understand and uh, I had a tour about two years back on his workshop and it was surprising that I was not able to ask him what do you do so I would suggest that check around you would be surprised there is IOT uh, entrepreneurs all around you and uh, they are doing things very very economically so half of the things that I would mention is 
uh, if you need an economical um, solution, look for a cloud-based solution where you can subscribe for um, a subscription which is far less than you can install on your premise and people will ask you to in install infrastructure, don't do that. So that's what your uh, my advice to you. So thank you, Nisha. I believe uh, or I hope that both Harish and Nisha, I have answered your question. Oh, OK. Who are the industry leaders in the technology we have talked about? Uh, on a scale of two, where is IBM praised? Where is India in respect of these technologies? Deployment of these techs, OK. So uh, in AI, OK, and um, I would rather say that the top players are, IBM is also one of them, Amazon, Google, and um, Okay, so Amazon, Google, and um, one second, let me. There is a startup which is pretty good at AI, and it is really uh, I, for I forgot. Okay, so they they are the top players actually, and uh, IBM is also about fourth or fifth of it. We are catching up, and uh, the reason that we did this is we were actually a bit behind of recognizing what is going to be the next big thing. So here is the problem with uh, the emerging technologies. We can have hundreds of technologies. We don't know which is going to get big, or if we are betting big on this. And uh, so, OK. So if, if I would rather say that Elon Musk also actually features very big on the AI technology side, especially on his cars and his rocket technologies, he's, he's betting big on AI. And uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get what it was. There was one more about cryptocurrency, right? OK, so I think I read that correctly. Um, cryptocurrency has been a hot topic for a while. Can you elaborate the difference between Indian banking and European banking adoption on cryptocurrency? OK. So cryptocurrency, um, bitcoins, one of the things that India is cautious about is cryptocurrency. It is looking for a regulation. It has not opened the market for it. But in Europe and in in US and basically the East East uh, countries, they were they are, were and are still big on cryptocurrencies. I believe that China would be fast opting to cryptocurrencies very fast because they remove the dependencies on a lot of things, especially the USD and the gold. And um, India on on the other hand, is very, very cautious. And I like the fact that India is very cautious because one of the few things that cryptocurrency requires is regulations, which we have not seen it yet. It is, It has been exploding on its own without a regulation in place. And I am in the business of risk analytics. So we have this problem with risk regulations. We might be looking at the next scam in cryptocurrency to fast bring in regulations and it is a it is a danger waiting to happen according to me so that's what i think about uh, i'm not really big on european markets but i'm trying to tell you that the east indian markets or or japan china and uh, the southeast asian countries especially singapore and um, thailand okay are big on cryptocurrencies So next question is, hmm, physical distancing being part of a new normal, would IoT and similar enhanced technology be future adoption of travel, tourism, and hospitality? For sure. Seriously, for sure. OK, so IoT, I would rather say that there was IoT before um, COVID especially in airports and uh, and uh, uh, a certain chain of uh, host hotels i would rather say that i would like i would like to quote a, a particular hotel which i had frequented in hong kong and this was just for dinner i'm not really sure which was it so they had uh, a robot which handled 
um, front desk uh, registrations and it was pretty good at it. So it actually asked for the scanning of the passport, it would ask for the, the um, registration um, barcode and it automatically printed the keys and we, we just watched it. Okay. So this was banning about three out of four desks and there was one person who was actually a human person in the middle of the night. So we went there for dinner at about 10 and this lady was actually there with three other robots. And uh, I, I don't remember which, um, which hotel it was, but it was interesting to see that. Oh, quantum computing effectively. Oh, that's Jordi's con. So Jordi, can you wait a bit for quantum computing? It's because this is our next topic. So after that, I think I will take this question. I can actually park it then. So let me let me move on with quantum computing then. So that's that's interesting. So quantum computing. Somebody said that only God can count that fast. That's the world of quantum computing. So in the labs quantum computing. What is changing in the world is there are certain problems that today's computer cannot solve without serious quantum power, computing power and that too will span years to complete. A new computation model is emerging. The quantum computers working with classic computers via the cloud would enable discoveries in many disciplines that was deemed very complex to solve before. So what's different? So quantum computings use qubits for exponential computing which gives serial parallel processing and it stores data as uh, while conventional um, computer stores data as 0 and 1, qubits actually stores 8 times more and with uh, various states and which means that the, the computation power that it gains is actually exponential. So quantum computing leverages quantum mechanics properties like superimposition. So superimposition is, if you know wave theory, I do not like physics, so I had to read this up. But I understand a bit of it. I do not like to think that I have to research more on this, so I'm just going to explain what I understood. Superpositioning means that if two waves actually happens together, okay, it will superimpose. It's like hearing two piano keys together. So it will not cancel each other out, but it will enhance the note. And interference means that data would behave in such a way that it cannot be predicted. Sorry, interference means that um, there will be two waves, okay? If they interfere, either they cancel each other or they enhance its properties. So that is called interference. It's wave interference theory. Entanglement on on other part was if there are two pairs of um, qubits, it can exist in a very convoluted state that nobody can predict its next path. And that is how they manipulated the state of qubit. Okay. So basically qubit is uh, a data storage um, element for computing, quantum computing. And it is not for 0 and 1. It is actually a bit more into 8 parts. It has various states. It also mimics the Schrodinger's cat, which I don't like. So I would rather have it named. So thanks, Sheshadri, for reminding of that, even in quantum computing. And Google, Amazon, IBM, Microsoft is racing to have global access for quantum computing. And uh, quantum computing can help companies without billion dollar budgets design super batteries, complex chemicals, and understand the universe. In fact, on October 2019, um, Google announced that it has quantum supremacy, which means that its computer can solve a problem that takes years in some seconds. So it actually posed a problem and said that this one takes 13 years and it was solved in 600 seconds. But I've been uh, refuted it, saying that that particular thing didn't take 13 years. It, take about, uh, it took about, about two or three days for for an IBM supercomputer. So that kind of tug of war happens. So to answer um, um, Jordi's uh, question, it is wherever Google, Amazon, and IBM is, 
the Indian researchers are also involved. I know this specifically because my friends are in quantum computing uh, research labs in India. And uh, is there any startup of it? I don't know of it at this point, but it may be, and uh, this is not my particular brand, so I have to search on it. Maybe I can find you the answer later. But I know that there are people whom I know working on quantum computing. And they generally hire physicists, and uh, this particular person that I know, he was um, a rank holder and a gold medalist in MSc Physics, and IBM hired him. And uh, he's working in Hyderabad. So this is what quantum mechanics and quantum computing means. And uh, if I go to quantum computing use cases, medicine and materials, this is what I said, chemicals and drugs are being discovered at record pace. Finding optimal paths for logistics, this is operational research and uh, salesman's path and all those things. And uh, find a new way of financial modeling. So if anybody knows um, model risk management, it is seriously complex. And it is also partnering with artificial intelligence to make uh, search for data very, very faster. So if you want to search large uh, data sets, which uh, is ex especially uh, images or videos, quantum computing can actually partner with AI to make searches faster. So cloud security, making uh, cloud computing more secure by using laws of quantum computing is making sure that private data is safe no matter where it is stored and processed. Okay. So these are the computing of use cases. I did a, a presentation for kids earlier. And to teach what is quantum computing use cases was, I gave the scenario. Uh, everybody likes chocolates. And interestingly, cocoa, the tree, is actually going extinct because of, um, of global warming. And uh, there is a fight and there is a race for finding a suitable substitute for chocolate by quantum computing. So the reason why I had to say this is uh, we might be the only generation who can actually eat dairy milk or whatever chocolates that is available because cocoa is going to be the new gold going forward unless quantum computing steps in to find out something that is very similar and make a fake cocoa kind of a substitute. So we have substitute to vanilla, we can also have substitute to cocoa. So that was what it is. So I need to rush, so let me do this. So CAMS, and CAMS is about cloud analytics, mobile, security, and social. And uh, you can see that here. So let me go to cloud. So cloud is a poor man's um, solution for for access to certain things where it can be given a subsidized rate. So what is cloud computing is, it is an on-demand availability of co computer system resources, data storage, and computing power without direct active management of the user, which means that a person like me can have, um, I would say, the Apple Cloud to store my documents and my, my music. But do I worry about how they're managing my document and my music? Not really. Am I worried that uh, if it is going to be available 24 bar 7? Yes, I am. But uh, should I be worried on that? No, they have guaranteed that I will get 24 bar 7. So that is a huge uh, facility that is available for a subscription. So why is cloud, cloud computing? Accessibility, I can do it anywhere. Cost, fraction. And what is the type of cloud, cloud computing? So the most famous was SaaS, software as a service. So if I'm actually having a solution, let's say that a solution which can do a banking software. And I say that I can provide you as SaaS, which means that I put it on a cloud, I would install it, and I would provide the solution, and I give a username, password, and a web link to that particular bank and say that here is your solution that's called SaaS, OK? And just before it is called the PaaS, or the platform as a service. So if the bank goes to a cloud provider and says that, can you give me a set of servers 
and a set of, um, I would rather say, softwares. I will have my in-house team to build a solution for me, and I will pay you subscription fees for that. So that is platform as a, as a service, okay? And if that same people say that, can you just give me the cloud, the boxes, and the, the, um, the username password to access your boxes, and I will build the software, I will build my solution, and that is called infrastructure as a services. So this one takes a person with a really genius technology to actually ask, and this would be the lowest of rate, and this would be highest rate, a uh, higher rate, and this would be a highest rate. So what are the advantages? 24 bar 7, anywhere, everywhere, don't worry about the breakdowns, and you don't need to even worry about where you put your uh, servers. It is somewhere some, uh, in somebody else's garage, and you have an access over the internet. So if you're not a technologist, you don't take the burden of an unknown technology that might cost you money, sample and use, and this is the best option for small and medium enterprises. So Nisha, if you're listening to this, cloud computing with uh, IoT is one of the best bets that you can actually look for. So analytics, and uh, I believe that uh, there was a question earlier, I can take that. Um, so they mentioned that, one second. Is cryptocurrency um, something that a small to medium enterprise can use? Oh, okay. So, or not cryptocurrency, blockchain, I think. Yes, blockchain. I would rather say that blockchain has not been that mature. So, why we find even IBM has problems actually getting a project or a contract with blockchain clients, okay? So I'll tell you why this is. So to get a blockchain working, there would be about five to six people. You remember that structure, okay? This five to six people are not in your company. So if you want to buy a blockchain technology, you have to convince those other people to buy a blockchain, um, the technology, so that every six of you have to work. So unless if there's a regulation around it, there's no push for clients to actually buy this. So if you're a small to medium company, if your vendors don't have the bandwidth or the infrastructure or the money to invest along with you, then that might be a problem. So if you can actually have a winning use case, you should make sure that there is a consortium of people to say that, I want to invest in blockchain, I am putting in the money, let's go find a vendor, that works. So. That is something that we have seen from the technologist side that uh, a, a, a client has that they have not thought it through. They say that, okay, fine, I want to be in blockchain, which is the next best thing. But then we ask, who are your partners? Did they agree to it? Then we find that one person says, no, nah, I don't think it is happening. There is a blockchain, maybe it will go away for two years, and I don't think I will actually um, invest in something that is going away. So that is how they think. So take your decisions wisely. That's what I would rather say. So analytics. Um, we are talking about big data, and we are talking about um, data analytics. We are talking about how to crunch data. We are talking about data mining. Okay. So what we do here is there's a huge amount of data. Machine or humans are, cro are creating it. If you look at the internet, even the YouTube that I'm I'm actually creating, it is. GBs of data every every second, okay? And this data is available on the net in the in the computers that they have. They don't know how to use it. So big data platforms are necessary for mid-sized and large companies now. And they have to crunch it to say that what's the meaningful data here. So so many people say that I have this this problem, and then we say that look inside your company, you have the data, and you might be able to do actionable items on it. And one of the things that we try to teach them is do analytics on your own data. Maybe you'll find the solution within your, within your data. So for that, they are actually exploring analytic needs. They are trying to find out whether collaboration is essential. And the next critical step is how much amount of data and the government policies around it. Data privacy is big here, especially for Europe and you have a restriction on what type of data you can use and how much you can use. And then you should have data scientists actually crunch your data. 
So they have found a lot of at least 40% usage of their own data. And I will tell you in a bit how it works. So here is what is the evolution of analytics here. So descriptive analytics means that you look at a company's financials, that is the, the sales report, the, the bank balance and everything, that is called descriptive data. You found out what is happening in the history and find out, uh, try to make sense of it, okay? So that is called descriptive analysis. You can do it by, I would rather say, once again, I have wrote this down. Yeah, look at the company reports and use observations, case studies. And the diagnostic uh, analytics are, if something went wrong, what happened? Look at the data to find out what was wrong. That is di diagnostic analytics. So the predictive analytics is the combination of these two. That is, look at the past, look what went wrong, and then try to predict the future. So the predictive analytics is a combination of these two to predict trends on what might be tomorrow, okay? And prescriptive analytics is, along with predictive analysis, okay, along with predictive analysis, you're trying to find out what can be done with, uh, with your information and try to find out cures to it. Fix your problems using your diagnostic and your predictive analytics and then move on. Cognitive analytics means that you mimic your human brain, so which means that it would apply to certain tasks to say that mimic it with language, mimic it the way that it remembers things. If you found out something that applies to you, store it in your database so that you can remember it later. So cognitive analytics is trying to solve a problem with your past experience and past memory and the past data that you have stored in a past or a, or a past problem solving uh, exercise, okay? So this is the evolution of analytics right now and we are certainly right now in cognitive analytics and that's where we are sitting. So now it is getting merged with AI and the Internet of Things and analytics, everything is going into, it's, it's very hard to uh, find out the, the boundaries here. So mobile. So here is the top few techno statistics to tell you that why companies are interested in how you use your phone. 80% of users used a mobile device to search the internet in 2019. 40% of the transactions were done using mobile uh, device. 80% was the percentage of data traffic by the end of 2020. And 50% website is actually tuned for everything. Three out of four shoppers use mobile device for physical shopping. I don't have to tell you all those things, you do it, okay? What does it mean to a technology? So it means that they have to be cognizant on app development, their solutions, which is web should be completely, uh, okay. Here's what I found. Oh, so here is AI trying to tell me what to do. Okay, that is silly. So, uh, they, they, they must be actually cognizant in app development and the web solution should be compatible for mobile device. So it means that now mobile application is here to stay. So mobile app computing is um, defined as a technology where you can take your device with you. It does not have a physical link. It has concepts like mo mobile communication, mobile hardware. So here are the famous apps that uh, is there WhatsApp, Telegram, TikTok. So WhatsApp was sold to Facebook in 20, I think 2011 or 2015. I'm not really sure I had the data somewhere, but I didn't write it down. For $15 billion, Telegram is actually um, something that was actually done by a Russian, um, uh, Russian computer uh, com uh, technologist, and it is banned in Russia, interestingly. And they, they are actually valued at seven to nine billion dollars, and they say that they will not sell. TikTok, interestingly, is with its parent company, it's Chinese, it's uh, valued at 75 billion dollars. So you can see how much data is valuable for people. So, social. 
So this is entirely about how we use the social media. I can actually cut this short with a very simple example. This is about my parents and uh, they decided to buy a car, okay? And uh, they went to one, I would, I would start with brand A and brand B, so you can understand, okay? I don't want to name um, brands here. So they went to brand A and they actually looked at their their preferences they were almost ready to buy it and when they looked for the color so the the people said that no i don't have white so they had to say that okay fine let me go to the brand b okay but brand a said that before you go can you give you give me 5000 rupees so that as a deposit just to make sure that you come back so they go, went to the brand b okay they found what they're looking for white was there so they bought it okay or they they booked that car so my parents are um, senior citizens and um, they came back to brand a and said that oh we chose the other brand can i have our deposit back so they said no they didn't they don't want to do it so they were pretty adamant about it and that is when i come home okay so i come home on the weekend my mom is actually really upset that she lost her five thousand she's like uh, the heavens will ask for their soul and all those things and uh, she was pretty upset my dad was philosophical about the 5000 then i thought i went and liked their website i went inside and said that your showroom at this particular place has asked for a deposit from senior citizens and has not given back the the manager was rude and the salesperson had initially said that they will give back the thing and I posted it on top of it my friends went and commented on top of it so long story short within two days my parents got their 5000 back and this is the perfect example of social it is all about customer satisfaction because we are that finicky one bad news on the social media is really making people worried so social media is big these days so there's something called social listening uh, a role which was not there earlier now we have social listeners we have social influencers we have everything okay so we are getting to be mature that we are listening to social media like facebook like linkedin and whatnot everywhere okay even even whatsapp to see uh, if any bad news is propagated one of the best example is a leading uh, fresh uh, produce app i think you know that uh, it is based in chartala and it is now reeling against uh, um, a video which was saying that it is not fresh okay so i don't know how they are actually going to deal with it but they have delayed slightly or there's a slight delay in responding to it so i don't know whether damage is already done here so security so one of the overlooked factors in the digital cloud is sorry digital journey is cloud analytics mobile everything is great but it does not work with security so what why is it important once upon a time it was it was antivirus and casper key which uh, it was the it was the customer's requirement to actually do nowadays uh, your laptop comes with an installed antivirus and your cloud is actually secure and you're not the only person who's worried about your security and um, i would rather say that uh, the 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 very famous uh, i would say communication app zoom had a problem with that so security breaches and uh, uh, there is 18 billion security events that is happening and uh, people are looking out about reference architecture on security now it is everybody's business because if you want to give subscription based uh, access to a person you cannot deal with client who lost their data while accessing your cloud or mobile or app and it is now your problem that they should be secure so at that point security became big so it suddenly became the fourth or the fifth pillar of the camps uh, thing so i'm just cutting it short so that i'm running out of time okay so this is going to be interesting augmented with uh, virtual augmented and virtual reality so there are two things ar and vr 
There are technologies that superimpose computer generated images on user view, that is AR. And there is also virtual reality for entertainment and business purposes. So what does it mean to us? So AR is like Pokemon Go. And uh, here is something that I saw in the Philippines. So there are clusters of people actually going and standing somewhere. And they are, they, are, they are not moving for about hours together. And they are playing. They are always looking at their phone. So they are, they are playing the Pokemon Go. So where we can find in unlikely places, in malls, in, in uh, street um, corners, and in dustbins, all those, those, uh, those creatures. And if you collect it, and you go to the next level. OK. So do we have it? Yes, we do. If you have a Snapchat, which lets you have horns and wings, yes, you have AR. So what are the serious use cases? So let's say that changing clothes. So this is particularly applicable to husbands and kids. I, I found that out. You cannot get them to try clothes. So many clothing brands provide virtual fitting rooms that allow shoppers to try on as many clothes that you want without changing. For choice of colors and sizes, great. I think Charney has uh, some kind of uh, features. Charney Lehri of um, PGP has some kind of features in Stylebox. And uh, I'm, I'm keen to um, sample that, not yet done that. So IKEA in Hyderabad has the IKEA place, which you can try before you buy, which means that you can place your uh, 2,000 furniture items in your rooms. The shoppers are allowed to do that to see if it fits the living room or matches the color of the wall. You can take a picture, and then you can actually put it there. The advertising companies like uh, Burger King, it launched a burn that ad. And in Brazil, if you point a finger to a print ad, and it will burn, and it will give you a coupon which offers a free Whopper at Burger King. It also has AR training for 3D missionaries, where you can zoom in details and learn about it without risk. So virtual reality, this is pure virtual reality. So it means that you will go into an imaginary world, and uh, it is totally different from your real world. It is addictive. It is gaming, and you can get addicted to it. So for this, you need a VR headset. And the VR can be used in business for specializing devices and machinery. It is used for um, healthcare, aviation. Aviation, if you want to teach a pilot, it is huge money. So if you want to simulate um, aviation cockpit, this is the way to do it. And uh, surgical procedures on VR mannequins. And uh, that is also being used at this point. 3D print printing. So I'm not going to talk about this. Um, I don't know where 3D printing is going. And uh, basically, it is now looking at printing with, um, with materials. It can be either molded plastic or, or metal and um, alloys. And uh, it is actually uh, in vogue at this point, but people don't know. There would be regulations coming inside. Um, there has been incidents in US um, where somebody assembled a gun and shot his wife with it. And uh, all through 3D printed. So I, I hope you get the guest of it. So there's heavy regulations on this to not uh, manufacture uh, dangerous things. So I'm coming to the last uh, stage, and uh, and this is my last slide. So to summarize, I would rather say a computer lets you make more mistakes faster than any other inventions, with possible exceptions of handguns and tequila. And on your left, you can see the programmer's prayer. So technologies like us, we have to change a lot with technology. So here is our prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So that's us, programmers. So any questions? I would stop, and this is questions. And if I didn't answer, you can use this uh, Gmail to send us a mail, and we can actually close. Meanwhile, like, share, and subscribe. Thank you very much for your patience. I don't know whether it helped, but I really hope it was insightful. And uh, 
Yes. So, <laughs> Namit and um, Parvot tells me to remind you again about the dream wallet. We are very close and uh, it is a matter of uh, great prestige that we could come this far. It is about uh, 48,000 short. So help out however you can with us as much as you can and as much as your heart allows you. So I, I understand that it is a tough time for all of us, but if you can spare, please do. So thank you very much for being a beautiful audience. And um, I will be hearing feedbacks individually, I think. And uh, I hope that we will not bore you so much with the next presentation because it is part of the domain and we will try to keep it short. But this one was big. And I hope that you, you got something out of it. And uh, we can discuss further when we meet in person or you can send us a mail and I will get you the people who can who can talk about it in much more in depth. And uh, we are bringing technologists which are provision in each fields and uh, we would like you to have a good time. Thank you very much.